Okay, we've gone through the basic factors, the future value of a single sum, the present value of a single sum, the future value of a series of payments, future values of a uniform series of payment or annuity, the present value of a series of payments, and the present value of a uniform annuity or uniform series of payments. Okay, you now have the equations, the basic equations that we're going to use in investment analysis. This lecture that we're going to cover now on the economic content is to provide a conceptual framework by which to evaluate investments. Later on, we'll get into capital budgeting and we'll get into a lot of the more details of how to handle taxes and debt and inflation and risk. But in terms of the general concept of how you analyze an investment, we're going to cover that today in, in this section that we call the economic content. And I'm going to present some terms that if you truly understand, if you walk out of this class or out of this course understanding these terms, it'll carry you in much of the world of finance. And it'll seem relatively basic, but it has a lot of content in it by which you can evaluate investments. Okay, in the last lecture, there was a summary of the factors that I just mentioned. We talked about how to adjust for the number of conversion periods per year so that we can look at problems that have annual payments or we can look at problems that have monthly payments or even daily payments. We looked at how to handle problems that had cash flows that had single sum amounts as well as series of payments or even uniform series of payments. And we learned how to use these equations, mix them and match them correctly to solve the problem. And then we spent some time on the capitalization factors and derived those. You've seen those in some of your farm management type of classes, but probably never understood where they came from. And these capitalization factors are important. If you go into any uh, investment type of problem or any uh, work, or if you're uh, working in real estate, they're going to talk about the cap rate. Now, if you understand these formulas, you understand where the cap rate comes from and these capitalization factors. Today's lecture, we're going to talk about the book value, the market value, yield, net present value. We're going to start these terms, introduce them in a single period model. I recognize that the single period model is something that you've already been exposed to, it's clear to you, and that you might think it's boring, but it helps us bridge the gap between the single period and the multi-period. The single period framework is very simple, you understand it, the mathematics is easy, when you get into the multi-period framework, it gets a little more complicated. So at the risk of boring you a little bit in the single period, we're going to do that so we can step into the multi-period world, which is the more common. And we're going to use a bond example to help explain these book value, market value, yield, net present value in a multi-period framework. Okay, we're still in chapter nine. You've had plenty of time to read chapter nine. Now we're moving in for the next section, we're now going to move into capital budgeting, chapter 10. Okay, looking at the economic content. The first definition, looking at the book value of a contract. Now we're gonna define it here, we're even gonna look how to calculate it, but I will say that we're gonna have it in our toolkit and it may be a, a month before we come back and actually implement this into a problem. The book value of any contract that's dealing with money through time is the present value of the future, or we can think of it the remaining payments of any contract discounted at the contractual rate. Remember the discount means taking any future sum of money from the right and bringing it back to the left using the appropriate time value of money equations. And if you look at the timeline, the future payments or any payments that we get sometime in the future on the timeline and we bring them back to the present. The contractual rate is the rate that is stamped on the contract. If you take out a car loan and the bank says that the annual rate on that car is 7%, that is the contractual rate. A year later, the rates may be at 10%. It doesn't make any difference. The contractual rate is what's stamped on that contract. Looking at the market value of a contract, the definition you'll see is very similar. 
It's the present value again of any future or all the remaining payments of any contract discounted, but the difference now is it's at the market rate. So if you're looking at that your loan payment on your car, that is a contract. Okay, it's a contract between you and your lender. If you're trying to find the book value, you would then discount all of your future payments that you owe on that car back to the present at whatever the contractual rate is, say 7%. However, if you wanted to know what the market value of that contract was, you'd go out and see what are car loans going for today. And let's say because the interest rates have been going down lately, let's say it's only 5%. That 5% today that you could borrow money for is the market rate. Even though you bought the car a year ago at 7%, which is the contractual rate, the rate that you could borrow money for today is the market rate, and that market rate fluctuates. The contract rate is fixed on the contract. So then we calculate the market value of that loan agreement with the bank, and if rates drop to 5% instead of 7%, but you're locked in paying 7%, that wasn't such a good deal, was it? You can see that that contract, that loan contract, the value of that to you is worse because if you hadn't locked in at 7%, you could be borrowing at 5%, your payment would be less, but you're locked in at the higher payment. So the market value of that contract is going to be lower than its book value. The market rate is because if you wanted to refinance your loan, a house, a car, a bond, any type of contract that can be bought or sold on a daily basis or minute by minute basis, it becomes a real issue. Why wouldn't you go with the market rate? Well, that's where in the mortgage market, some people did go with a variable rate loan. So their payments were adjusted to the market. Although when the rate started going up and they couldn't make their payments, then it became very difficult for them. If the rates were gonna go up, they'd been better off with a contractual rate that was fixed. Okay, the economic content. Again, another definition is the net present value. Okay, the net present value of an investment can be defined simply as the present value of the cash inflows, any money that we get from this contract, minus the present value of cash outflows, any money that we pay out relative to this contract, where the cash flows are discounted at the required rate of return on an investment, or we refer to it as a discount rate. We'll talk more as, as the course evolves, what, what is the appropriate required rate of return on investment, what's the appropriate discount rate. Okay, for now it'll be given. Okay, the net present value can be thought of as the investment profit over the required return to capital. It turns out if there's a positive net present value and your discount rate is 10%, you not only earn 10% on that investment, you actually earn some extra. And that extra is the profit over and above your 10% return that you required. Okay, the last definition is the yield on an investment. And yield is a term that you hear all the time. You know, what's the yield? What's the rate of return on this investment? What's its yield? Well, let's look at how to calculate that. This yield is the rate of return on an investment. And to calculate this, the yield is the discount rate that makes the present value of cash inflows equal to the present value of cash outflows. That implies then it's the rate that makes the net present value equal to zero by definition. If you look at this definition and the previous definition for the net present value, you can see that this has to be true because the net present value is the present value of cash inflows minus the present value of cash outflows. If we want to make the rate that makes those two equal, that implies then that the net present value will be zero. This is also called the internal rate of return. And we will, in this class, use those two terms interchangeable. Whether we're talking about the yield or the internal rate of return, the definition is the same, the calculation is the same, and its meaning is the same. But the internal rate of return is used in capital budgeting. Okay, as I mentioned, we're going to start this in a single period model recognizing that when I ask you the question, you're going to know the answers because you've all done this in a one period model. Then from that, we're going to see that these definitions also hold in a multi-period framework, although the arithmetic is a little more complicated. We'll keep the numbers very simple so we can do the arithmetic, a lot of it in our head. If you invest $100 
and earn a rate of return of 10%, how much money will you have in one year? $110, right? Your principal plus the 10% interest. You can see that we take the $100 in our principal plus the 10% interest on the $100. So at the end, we have the $100 plus the $10 interest to give us $110. Now in this next slide, you see that if we recognize that that $100 is the present value and we're multiplying the interest rate times the present value, then the future value is equal to the present value times one plus R. That is where we see the uh, formula again for the future value of a single sum of money. You did this in your head, but also recognize that that's consistent with what we've been learning about the time value money factors. Okay? If you can earn 10% on your money, how much would you pay today for an investment that promises to pay $110 one year? That's its market value. What is this investment worth that promises to pay you $110 in one year if you can earn 10% on your money? $100. Intuitively, you see that that's the market value? The market value of that investment is $100. That's what you'd be willing to pay because that would then promise to return you 10%, which is the market rate. If we looked at this, if we have an investment that pays us $110 today, how much would we pay? What is its present amount today if we needed to get 10% on that money? So it would be $110. We can factor out that present value and multiply it by this factor of one plus 10%. Now, if we're trying to solve for this V naught, looking at that equation, we would divide both sides by that factor of one plus 0.01. Now, using the uh, rules of exponents, that division can be changed just by making that exponent a negative one. Nothing fancy there, just the rules of exponent and the, and the rules of solving a simple equation. And we can see then that the answer is by basically taking the present value of that future amount of $110, we get our answer of 100, just exactly what you knew the answer was already. If you look at that equation, hopefully you recognize that that's the present value of a future single sum of money. So we have this formula now, the present value of a single sum of money or remaining payments gives us the market value. Look back in your definition. How did we define market value? We said it was the present value of future remaining payments discounted at what? The market rate. Okay, what's the moral of this story? You knew from your previous experience that the market value of this investment that promised to pay $110 one year from today, if you could earn 10%, if that was your required return on your money, you knew that the market value was $100. That's what you would pay. Now do you see that we can actually calculate that by this formula? <coughs> the market value is the present value of the remaining payments discounted at the market rate. What is the rate of return on an investment yield that costs $100 today and promises to return $110 in one year? 10%, okay, that's the yield. The yield on this investment is 10%. Well, if we look at this, and let's calculate it. If we have a future value of 110, and we invest $100 today, what interest rate does that have to earn to make this true? Well, the rate then, and it shouldn't surprise you, is we take the future amount minus what we paid for it. That gives us our return, our dollar amount of return. In this case, the interest. It gives us a $10 return, and we divide that by what we paid for it. You earn $10 and you paid $100 for it, what's your rate of return? Well, it's obviously 10%. What is the inflow from this investment? Meaning the inflow, what comes into the company? What comes into you? What do you receive in this investment? You see, you get the inflow is $110 to you. And what's the present value of the inflow? The inflow is $110 that we receive one year from now. We discount it back at the uh, rate of 10%. And so the inflow is equal to 100, the present value of the inflow. The outflow is $100 because it costs $100. We have to pay somebody $100. The present value of the outflow, since we're paying it today, there's, we don't have to discount it to the present. It's already in present terms, so the present value of the outflow 
is $100. Notice that at the rate 10% that the present value of the cash outflows is equal to the present value of the cash inflows. If and only if that rate is 10%. So in this particular case, the yield was the rate that makes the present value of cash inflows equal to the present value of cash outflows. And that matches your intuition. So these definitions of the market value and the yield really are not that far out. They match with what you already know. Now let's go to the net present value. What is the net present value of an investment that costs $95 but pays $110 in one year but we can earn 10% on our money. What's the profit over and above that 10% earning? Okay, the net present value, remember, is the present value of cash inflows minus the present value of cash outflows. The present value of cash inflows, we're taking that future sum of money, $110, we're discounting at 10% for one period. What is the uh, present value of the cash outflows? We said it costs $95 today, so the present value of the cash outflows is 95. From your previous slide, you know that the present value of cash inflows in this particular example is 100, minus, of course, the 95, which then gives us $5. So our profit, okay, or our net present value is $5. It's over and above 10% that we would have gotten on a $95 investment. Now, getting a little more complicated, what is the yield of this investment that costs $95 and promises to pay $110 in one year? We know it pays something more than 10% because the net present value is positive. We're earning something more than the 10%, but how much more? How do we figure that out? The inflows, in this particular case, we're going to get $110 in one year. The outflow cost us $95. That's how much we're paying today. Okay, by definition, we need to find the rate that makes the present value of cash inflows, that's this, <coughs> equal to the present value of cash outflows, the $95. By definition of yield. So, if we look at the arithmetic, if we divide both sides by this uh, 1 plus r, and then we uh, multiply through the uh, parentheses, and then we subtract the 95 from both sides. And then you can obviously see that we're going to divide both sides by the 95. So we have this $110.95. So we basically uh, earned $15. And we bought it for $95. So it's $15 divided by the $95 we paid for it. You have a 15.8% rate of return. Or the yield. Now, all of you could have figured this out if I'd given you a little bit of time. You would have recognized, just looking at that, well, we get $110. We paid $95 for it. That's $15 return. We paid $95 for it. You divide that, and you would have come up with this. I took you down a little different path by showing you that, by definition, this rate okay, is the rate that makes the present value of cash inflows equal to the present value of cash outflows. This formula gets more complicated in the multi-period framework, but these definitions that I have just gone through work. If we look at this in a timeline, again drawing our line, at time zero we're paying $95 for this investment. At the end of the first period we're getting $110. What is the R? We look at that and we choose to use the present value of a single sum of money. Now we could have used, in this case, the future value of a single sum of money but I chose the present value. Noticing that, in this case, the present value is 95, and the uh, future value is 110. The rate we're trying to find out for one period. And by definition, this rate that makes the present value of the cash inflows equal to the present value of the cash outflows gives us our yield. So in our calculators on this single period model, Instead of working out the calculations as you would normally have done, 110 minus 95 all divided by 95, <laughs> now I want you to get in the mindset of the rate that makes the present value of cash inflows equal to the present value of cash outflows. And we see, put in 1N, a minus 95 present value 
zero out the payments because we're dealing with single sums of money. The future value is 110. We compute the I and it comes out, no surprise, 15.8%, exactly what we would have calculated if we had done it the traditional way.